Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Education Instruction Full Committee. Today is February 21st, and it is 9 o'clock, so we're doing pretty good already. Uh, we normally start our committee with the uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you would like to join us, please do so now. Thank you, and Vice Chair Raper, would you open us with a word of prayer, please? I'd be honored, Madam Chair. May, may we bow in prayer. Lord, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for your blessings. They're undeserved, and you just still bless us anyway. Lord, uh, we ask uh, uh, your hand of mercy upon this uh, group, uh, your hand of uh, intelligence and wisdom, and may we... Uh, we uh, uh, your hand of also discernment, and may all that we do just be pleasing you, and uh, we glorify you. Thank you for your son and his sacrifice and his grace and his mercy. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Everybody here. All right. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Representatives Sapicki, yeah. Chisholm, here. Cochran, here. Darby, here. Dixie, Glenn, here. Hakeem, Hicks, here. Johnson, Leatherwood, McCowman, here. Reagan, Todd, here. Warner, here. White, here. Vice Chair Raper, here. Chair Lady Moody. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, members, does anyone have any personal orders before we begin? Uh, yes, Representative Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair Lady. I wanted to give a shout out to my intern who was in the place, Sydney. Uh, wave your hand. Everybody give her a hand. Oh. Glad to have you here. Anybody else? Well, today, members, uh, as you know, we have invited the Hume Fogg Academic Magnet School, and they are close by, so maybe someday we can plan a field trip over there to actually see, see what all is going on in the building. And, uh, but right now, um, on my calendar to speak, oh, wait a minute, we have a bill. I'm excited. I saw the list of guests, and I'm like, let's go, let's go. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, members, there is one bill on our calendar, and uh, it is House Bill 896. Second. And Representative Hurt, I see you here. If you will describe, you have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. Members, House Bill 896 refers to the textbook adoption extension. In 2016, the legislature, in partnership with the governor's office and the State Board of Education, undertook the replacement of common core state standards and put into place arguably the most transparent and thorough standards review and input process in the country for English language arts, math, science, and social studies. At that time, they set the cycle for each of the re these reviews at once every six years. This legislation extends the cycle to eight years. With the pandemic and other considerations during that time, the increased workload for the Textbook and Instructional Materials Commission, as well as the need for teachers to get used to teaching the standards before they are substantially changed, the State Board of Education is seeking this change in the timeline going forward. This change is welcomed by districts as well as the Textbook and Instructional Materials Commission. I would like to bring your attention, members, to the fiscal impact and fiscal review has estimated that it will decrease state expenditures by $101,700. Very rarely do you see a, a, a decrease in state expenditures, but this legislation does include that. 
It also will decrease local expenditures approximately $16 million. And that's something that we're hoping that, that districts will, will take advantage of and steer that money toward early literacy programs. So with that, Madam Chair, I think there were a few questions and uh, Nathan James is available. I think he's on the list to make sure we clarify any, any questions on some time frames and things moving forward. Thank you, Chairman Hurt. Uh, members, we do have Nathan James on the list. Uh, all right, we will go out of session. Nathan James, will you please join us and again remind us who you're with? Happy to. Yes, ma'am. I'm Nathan James. I'm with the State Board of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Sapicki, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair Chairwoman. So, uh, Mr. James, just to clarify here, we are currently going through the textbook adoption with our locals for, for mathematics. Uh, Science. I, yeah, yeah that's right. We're, we're going through the, the standards review cycle right now right. on social studies. So the well. question I have in relation to the savings, um, textbook are going to be purchased here shortly at the local level mm -hmm. based off right now in state law of a six-year adoption cycle. The savings could be astronomical to, the, to those that were negotiating six-year contracts, being able to do eight-year contracts. Uh, Chairman Hurt's legislation on the House side is going to go to finance sub, finance full, calendar and rules, right. House floor, then the governor's desk for signature because the enacting legislation is when it becomes signed by the governor. Okay? Sure. Is there enough time there for those six weeks to happen because the Senate will beat us there, obviously? that our districts can take advantage of this bill to be able to purchase on eight-year cycles instead of six? Well, I can say it's certainly my hope that it will. Um, you, you know, I was just with uh, Senator Lumberg as it passed the Senate Finance Committee unanimously, and uh, it, it's, it's certainly my hope that it will. I can't tell you for certain in terms of every district in the state, but I can tell you that... <laughs> You know, in terms of the impetus behind the legislation, our, our board members, you know, each one serves a congressional district and they do so without pay. But one of the things they do to kind of ground their work is they do days in the district and they try to spend time all over their congressional districts, but with educators and principals and students on a routine basis. And I, in the off season, when you all aren't in session, I get to accompany them around the state. And that's a pretty cool part of my job. And one of the things that we heard continuously is this kind of call for a little more stability. Well, we are very interested under all circumstances in having the best standards, uh, having uh, strong standards in place, but also kind of taking a look at what can we do to kind of lend some stability there. And uh, so that's, that's where the genesis of, of the bill came from. And, and to, be, to be fair, I mean, the world doesn't fall apart if it doesn't happen. It's just something that, that can, you know, it, it'll cut our budget um, by about 25000 a year. But we think it's, we think it's um, a, a good thing to do in terms of having educators have the time that they need to, to really kind of get used to the standards as they teach them. So... It's, it's up to the legislature, and if, if you decide not to, obviously we'll, we'll do whatever you prescribe for us. So. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. James, thank you for being here. Yes, uh, I, I have a couple of questions, actually. The first one is I want to ensure that this is a maximum and not a minimum. That is to say, uh, if someone chooses, uh, a school district chooses to get uh, new textbooks because the publication cycle is shorter than the time we've allowed. This does not prohibit them to do that as long as they're willing to pay for it, correct? That's correct. The second question that I have in relation to that is likewise for the state school board, if they choose to, as a, as a body, to enact new standards, this does not prohibit that, correct? Uh, that's correct, but it would be through the process that's laid out in law. Remember, we we handle specifically ELA, math, social studies, and science. And as a matter of fact, in um, the gentleman from Cullioca's committee later this afternoon, we're going to be going through piece by piece all of the steps we take uh, on that. So, Yes, changes can be made, but yes, also the process and law must must be followed. 
So follow up for that for clarity, please. Yes, Chairman. Okay, one again, for clarity on that particular piece. Yes, sir. Uh, given that you follow the process, there is nothing that prevents you from taking that process up sooner than the, the time that's allocated in this bill, correct? That's correct. Thank you, sir. Next on the list, I see Chairman, uh, Representative Dixie. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. And I don't know if this is for you or the sponsor. Um, I wasn't in the subcommittee that this came through, so I might, I'm looking at this brand new and I had questions about it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I guess one of my concerns or questions is that, uh, you know, we, I've been on the education committee since I've been in the House. Yes, sir. And one of the things that we've always talked about is that the teaching industry and how they teach teachers doesn't change. Everything stays the same. It needs to evolve. And my concern by stretching this out more, how does that help us? Um, because things change rapidly, especially in this world. And the way students learn different things are different. And I, it seemed to me we should be moving in the other direction to make sure that we have the flexibility to adapt as things move and change in this world. So, so what I would say, for, first of all, there's, there's a couple of points that, that you're making there. And I, I totally get where you're coming from in terms of what seems to be an unchanging world as far as educator prep programs go. Now, that having been said, when you all adopted uh, the Literacy Success Act, there, there, there are several uh, there, there are several acts by this General Assembly and by previous General Assemblies that have caused substantial changes in the way the uh, EPPs function. And one of the tools that, that helps us all kind of keep track on that is uh, the EPP report card, which we do. Um, that, that allows you to see kind of some of the strengths and weaknesses of, of various EPPs. And, and I will tell you, uh, and uh, um, a uh, gentleman from Anderson can, can corroborate what I'm saying because he served on the committee. When it came time to uh, reshuffle that process for the educator prep uh, program report card, we had not only deans and teachers and professors and all of those folks, but also Representative Reagan to, to serve on that committee because of exactly the point that you were making, right? In the time you're up here, you haven't seen a whole lot of change on that. Now, the, the question in terms of what's best as far as academic standards go, you could argue that you should change standards every four years, or you could say every two years. I, you know, the major revamp and taking the process from what it was prior to 2015, which was, you know, the, the, the meetings weren't public, these decisions were largely made behind uh, closed doors to the process put in place um, by Chairman White and others in, in 2016 to have the public review periods. The, so far, just in social studies this year, we've had 114,000 reviews from Tennesseans. I, I defy anybody to find a state that's got a more open process than that. So it's... It's a matter of preference, and if, if, you, if you or, or the majority of, of members think that it ought to stay at six years, like I said, we, we will take the marching orders and, and move out smartly. Um, happy, happy to keep it the way it is. It, it's, uh, it's a matter of kind of uh, philosophy, really. And I had this discussion with another member last year to say, but if you moved it to four, should it be done every two? But there's got to be time for educators to dig into the materials, there's got to be time for the, uh, for the uh, Instructional Materials Commission to review, and, and these standards are, are you know, a very big deal. So I, I don't know if that helps, but I, I, I hope it does. I, I, know, I know where you're coming from. This, this is part, but you know what, I'll save this for the sponsor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman you. Reagan, I uh, see so you need another question. Thank you. No, I, actually, it's not a question. A point of clarity for those that are watching online, the acronym EPP has been used I'm as sorry. an education preparation provider. Hmm. Basically, that's the teachers' colleges and the other means that we have of getting teachers into our system. Just a point of clarity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sapicki. And just for clarification, Sir. Um, we're talking about the, the uh, adoption cycle but we have a standards review committee and we have a textbook commission that's appointed by this general, confirmed by this general assembly. 
are there any logistical issues there with extending this out to eight years to where you could have people, some of them doing standards for two, sta for, for, for two topics and some of them doing standards for other topics? Have you given any thought to maybe we need to change that? Uh, so uh, one of the provisions of this bill does move the adoption cycle out um, you know, from, from where it is now to precisely where it needs to be to, to fall into alignment so that you, because if we just did the standards and we didn't do the textbook cycle, you would necessarily have books uh, that were approved and in use around the state that are aligned to the previous set of standards. So in, in this bill, there's a mechanism that, that keeps those things in line moving from six to eight years. So absolutely, we've given it thought. We also had plenty of consultation with uh, Dr. Linda Cash, who is a superintendent of schools and also the chair of the Textbook and Instructional Materials Commission, and, and she very much uh, supports uh, this legislation. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions. Um, are you, we need to go back in session. Any objection? All right. Thank you. We will go back in session. Chairman Hurt, you are recognized. If you have anything to say. Uh, a lot of good discussion. I think the member did have a question for me up, up front. Madam That's Chair. correct. Thank you for that. Uh, Representative Dixie. Uh, you tell me that you said that it was going to say. How much did you say the savings were going to be? So for state expenditures, it decreased by $101,700, and it's estimated that the decrease in local expenditures is uh, a little over $16 million. Okay. Just a word. Yes. And thank you for those numbers. Yeah, I think that just at a time, especially here in Tennessee, um, I'm not... Uh, I get concerned when we say we're saving money in education when we need to be investing more in education. And so that's not an uh, advantage point for me um, because I feel like we should be doing more and giving more resources in order to uh, help our teachers and our LEAs to perform at, a optimal, uh, at the optimal uh, level. And um, I would hope that as excited as you were to say about how much this was savings, that we could have that same excitement in some other bills that are beneficial but may have a fiscal note attached to it. So I guess I have more of a statement than a comment a question. Chairman Hurt. Thank you for that, Representative. And, and I share your concern on some of those fronts. Um, I will say, you know, that we've increased education uh, dollars going toward education the last couple of years uh, substantially. But... I would also refer back to, in my opening statement, um, when I referred to, I hope that would um, incentivize districts to take that savings and move it toward other educational initiatives. And, and I know our focus here has been early education, but it would allow some, some extra funds there to free up to put back into other areas that districts see that are needed. So, but I share your concern on some of those other fronts too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sapiki. And just, just for clarification, in this bill, we're not decreasing funding to the locals at all. We're just allowing them, because of this extended time period, allowing them to reallocate that savings to something else. Is that correct? Yes. Chairman Hart? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions for the sponsor? Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just just a quick comment uh, from someone who taught was in the classroom for 27 years. And I remember, I remember these ancient history books, and and history happened yesterday. <laughs> and so my concern is, I hope that we're not going to end up with these ancient books in the classroom. But I understand what you're doing. Uh, just something that we need to watch out for. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, without objection. All in favor. Say aye. aye. Any opposed, say no. no. Uh, if you want to be recorded, no, let the clerk know. The ayes have it. And you will move on to finance, ways, and means. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you so much. Um, members, that completes our calendar for the day. So now we get to move to our guests that we have invited today from Hume Fogg Magnet School here in Nashville, close by. So um, if you will come up, you can sit at that table. 
we were going to go out of session. And there's a little button on there for your microphone to be turned on. It looks like a mouth with a... And uh, if you will please introduce yourselves and tell us what you do at Hume Fog. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. That means so much to us. Uh, my name is Amanda Smithfield. I'm the lucky librarian at Hume Fog Academic Magnet School. Hi, I'm Allison Halbrook. Got it. I'm Allison Halbrook. I am a teacher at Hume Fogg High School and a former student. Good morning. I'm Dr. Kelly Hargis, and I'm the executive principal at Hume Fogg. And I want to thank uh, Chair Lady Mooney and all of the representatives here for having us at the table and our students at the table so that you can hear voices from the schools. Thank you. And we do have two students. I think we'll have them introduce themselves when they tell you about, uh, about um, themselves uh, a little later on. Um, well, it is such an honor to be invited to speak to you today. Um, we are talking to you about um, our school, so close, the closest school here, uh, to, uh, to the legislature. And let's see here. So we are the oldest public school in Nashville. Uh, we are 111 years old, although uh, we actually go back to 1855. So this year is our 169th, uh, uh, our 169th commencement. We've actually been a school of choice for 83 years. Uh, during World War II, we became a Votech school. Uh, during that time, those, five, those four and five years, we actually uh, was open 24 hours a day, preparing people to uh, work on uh, defending our nation from World War II and providing all those materials that was needed. Uh, and then in 1983, so this is our 40th anniversary as an academic magnet school. Um, so a little bit about magnet schools in general, because a lot of times when we talk about school choice, uh, we are often like don't think about magnet schools, but many of you live in districts that have, have, have school districts that have magnet schools. So something that is uh, about a magnet school is that they are actually run by the LEA. So in our case, it's Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Um, oftentimes they have a theme. So ours is advanced academics. Um, they, uh, their, their aim is to bring, to, to attract students to a location, um, and especially when they were started, it was to, um, you know, bring students together who might not necessarily pick, uh, be zoned for that school, where they would choose that school um, to provide like a, um, and a uh, student body that was more diverse. So you're trying to attract um, all different sorts of kids to your school, um, and there's a theme, you know, that you bring together for that keeps them then. And also, we follow the same rules uh, and regulations of public schools. Um, although, in our case, we do have entry requirements. We can talk a little bit about that. Our entry requirements are that all of our students are required to earn a B average. Um, and meet or exceed the 10 ready end of course, um, end of course is actually high school, but the 10 ready uh, TCAP assessment, uh, or have a total of 14 on national achievement tests. Uh, our students are required to take and pass a minimum of three advanced placement courses. As you know, the state uh, requires a focused elective for all of our Tennessee graduates. For our particular school, we our focus elective is advanced curriculum, and they are uh, required to take at least three. Most of our children take many more uh, than that. All of our core courses are honors level or advanced placement level. Currently, we have 23 uh, offered on our uh, campus. Uh, we also have students, of course, who participate in the AP Access for All. Um, our average ACT, as you can see, is 26.5, and we have been, uh, on two occasions uh, since my tenure, a National Blue Ribbon School, and we are a Tennessee Reward School. Our student profile, as you'll notice, we have um, just under 900 students, and that's what we keep every year. Um, 
We have 38 languages, home lang uh, languages spoken in the homes of students who attend our building. Uh, many opportunities for engagement and extracurricular, community service, faith. Um, we are nationally recognized in our visual and performing arts programs. Uh, of course, our students earn millions of dollars in scholarship. I want to make sure that you know that we do have a nice cross-section of students, and that's something that we are proud of. Um, our, our student body, in addition to the 38 languages, we mirror the demographics of Davidson County proper. And so our demographics kind of out, uh, look like what a cross-section of Davidson County, Nashville proper would look like um, generally. Uh, our most popular college of choice, as you'll see, is the uh, UT Knoxville. <coughs> I wanted to mention that we do have a number of students also, so even though we are advanced academically, uh, we do have students who have IEPs or uh, individual education programs as well as 504 plans, and we have several of those. We have two exceptional educators uh, who are there as well as prepare, paraprofessional, so we provide all of those services to students. Um, we're excited to share specifically about Lily. I'll ask Amanda to share with you about her. So one of the uh, one of the blessings has been, of course, meeting all my wonderful students. But as an MNPS school, following uh, those rules, um, you know, uh, if a student comes in and they have uh, a full time aid, then once they're accepted, they're accepted. You know, whatever we need to give them to be able to achieve. Uh, you know, of course, we, we, we follow that. So Lily Shaw uh, was uh, our student for four years, um, and she, um, she did have a full-time aid. Uh, she excelled in government uh, and uh, speaking. Uh, she did youth in government. Uh, after graduating from Human Fog, she went on to um, UCLA, uh, where she was uh, used all those skills from doing youth in government and by being so close to you guys here in the Capitol um, to advocate for disability rights. And the summer after she graduated, she she passed away in her sleep. But um, it was an honor. It's such an honor to have all these kids and to bring all their experiences in. And and that's just one of the beauties of, of being a magnet school and, and the beauty of Hume Fog. And we're excited to share that um, we do maintain high rankings, uh, as one would hope and expect out of, uh, out of an academic magnet high school. Uh, you can see our rankings there on the screen, uh, first in the state of Tennessee by Niche. Uh, U.S. News and World Report, of course, ranks us fairly high as well. Um, and the thing that I think I am most proud of will be on the next slide. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of as principal, and that is not only do we maintain, maintain high achievement scores, one would assume that we should because the students had to have a B average and meet or exceed those TCAP um, standards anyway. So unless we just get in the way, the students ought to be able to continue on with that, right? But what about the growth score? And often you hear students um, and groups of people who represent students who are high achieving saying that's really hard to push those students who are in that top stay nine up. And it is, um, it does require work and it is challenging, but it absolutely can be done. And at Hume Fogg, uh, we have shown that with level five growth in our students. And so even though we get students who are high achieving, when you pull people together and you get that, um, choice opportunity to, to grab those students who ha share that in common as well as the support of, of parents. Um, we're able to really do that. So we're excited about that. And I was asked to speak this morning, not just because I'm a teacher, but because I was a former student. So I would have graduated in the class of 1995. We were kind of that um, experimental class where they were not sure quite what was going to happen with Hume Fogg. It was initially, I believe, supposed to be at West End, and then West End wanted the school back. So this was, y'all might remember, when uh, Nashville was not the burgeoning metropolis that we are now with all the tourists that you see downtown that we have now. And so, um, because Hume Fogg is a historic site, they kind of gave the building to, the, to Metro and said, do what you want to with it. And quite a few parents were a little hesitant because that's where all the honky tonks and stuff were. Um, but, but they sent us down there, and I was one of the initial classes. There was only like 125 students in my class. And I had actually come from a private school. I come from St. Joseph out of the Madison area. And it was the best experience I have ever had 
in my life. Every single time I think about it, my friends, I married, met my husband there, been married for over 20 years. Some of my best friends, I met at Hume Fogg. And part of it was just the exposure to so many different cultures and ideas. And when Dr. Hargis says we are a cross section of the city, we truly are. And if you walk inside of that building and observe the students, you would never know where they live, where they come from, what is their background. They all get along so well. They push each other for excellence. And in pushing each other, they push us as educators to push them as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, it wasn't until I started teaching that I had a health of respect for my teachers at Hume Fogg and understanding just how hard they worked to get all of us to excel. And it's just the expectation in our building that every student will go to college. And we pretty much have had that, at least since I've been there, and since 1991. Mm. Um, and that is exemplary. It is an institution of excellence. I look back at all the people who preceded me and only hope and pray that I am living up to that legacy because it is something that I am so grateful for every day of my life. Beautiful. All right, our two students are going to join us. We're glad you could join us and mm -hmm. first tell us your name and whatever else you have to share with us. Thank you. Say thank you so much for having us here. It mm -hmm. is an honor to be able to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Paul. I will graduate next year. Excuse um, me, is your mic on? Make sure. Is it? Oh, there. There it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will graduate next year and I am working on applying to the Naval Academy. I hope to commission to the Marine Corps and serve in a counterintelligence billet. Uh, at Hume Fogg, I'm involved in several clubs, including High School Conservatives, First Priority, Math Honor Society, and I also play volleyball. Um, I'm so glad I've gone to Hume Fogg, where I've been challenged academically. I believe that um, my high school experience will help me to succeed in future endeavors. Um, it's taught me so much about time management and organization and critical thinking. Uh, furthermore, there's a high standard at Hume Fogg, and um, we push each other, and the teachers push us to strive for excellence in all that we do, and this is something that I feel will truly benefit me outside of high school in uh, whatever I choose to do, and especially in the Marine Corps. Mm. Good morning. My name is Christina Amaya Sandoval, and I am a current senior at Hume Fogg. Um, First off, I just want to summarize my experience with two words, experiences and connections. Mm -hmm. So one of the main reasons why I decided to go to Hume Fogg was because of connections. Like I didn't realize how, how big the community of Hume Fogg was. My neighbor actually went to Hume Fogg when it was a technical school. So that's like a really long time. And I've had so many other people tell me, you should go to Hume Fogg, it'd be a nice experience. You'd, you'd grow in so many ways and you'd, you'd have like an amazing group of support. And it turns out they were right. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was the main thing for me, that I had so many connections. And I really couldn't do it without Dr. Hargis and all my teachers out there pushing me and like, you know, just encouraging me to, to keep going. And that's what I love about Hume Fogg. And the second thing is um, experiences. Experiences inside the classroom and outside of the classroom are one of a kind from discussions in English that are, mm -hmm. like are so profound and deep mm -hmm. to even like a simple ma like math and science lab like it's just amazing what you can do at the school and I hope that after I graduate to major in psychology with a possible double major in music and with that I hope to become a clinical psychologist with a missionary background thank you mm -hmm. for having me mm -hmm. thank you both for coming and sharing Mm -hmm. um, do would uh, would y'all be willing to? Now I don't want to cut off the presentation oh, no, too yeah, early, no, but while yeah. we have the students, yes, would y'all take some questions for us from us? All right, we'll start a list. And Representative Johnson, you're recognized. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, welcome. <laughs> Both of you mentioned um, the diversity in the school being important. Can you tell me a little bit about how that's been while you're at the school and how do you think that will serve you in the future? Mm. Um, yes, so I think um, coming to Hume Fog definitely has taught me so much um, about other cultures and I think that the diversity is an important aspect of the school. Um, we have assemblies sometimes where um, students uh, can um, teach us about other cultures. And I think that that is one of my favorite things that we do. I always mm -hmm. look forward to those assemblies. And uh, I think that's important because it shows us that different backgrounds and um, our differences can really come together mm -hmm. and be our strengths. Mm -hmm. And when we are willing to understand each other's differences, then we can really start to have deeper, more meaningful conversations mm -hmm. and just understand each other better. Representative Johnson, I think being able to see someone of my color is super important. And that's what I saw at Hume Fogg. I came from like a middle school where like diversity wasn't as present. And so to see like so many like Latinos, like from different like countries, especially like was a big impact for me and not and not just like Latin Americans, like people from all over the city. And like, as Clara mentioned, like these assemblies really like help us to value other people's cultures and stuff like that. And I really like that inclusivity that comes with it. I know y'all didn't ask me, but I'm to add in the statement here <laughs> that, um, you know, I think a lot about the blessings of liberty and um, having students that bring in all their experiences of themselves, but also their families, just reminds me every single day what a privilege it is to live in this country. A few years ago, I had a student that wore the same jacket every day to school. Finally, I asked him, I was like, you know, you wear the same jacket every day? Like, um, is there some sort of significance? And it was the jacket that his father wore when he was imprisoned by Saddam Hussein. How blessed are we to live in this country? And how blessed am I to have all of these students whose families come from all over, and yet they're all Americans. And they're all Tennesseans. Okay. Thank you for that question. Good work. Um, next, we have Representative Hakeem. Thank you, Madam Chair, and the educators in particular. Thank you. Uh, Y'all have made it hard to ask questions. Uh, things that we would have, I would have asked, you've already answered, but, but I do have a question, I guess, for, for is it Hargis? Oh, no, no wait a minute. Who, oh, oh, uh, Smithfield, yes. Oh, Smithfield, Smithfield. Oh, yes. I, I apologize. Um, when, when you have the diversity of languages mm -hmm. in the school, do the children have to come to the school uh, with, in a sense of speaking, English as a first language? Uh, do we, uh, there's an assistance with, you know, to help the children if they have a, uh, another first language? And uh, are there opportunities for children who may be right on the cusp of a B average, but, you know, I guess it's motive. I think it would be motivational for someone who's right on the cusp. Who would you may say have that be to rise up above that in that environment? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So we do have many students that uh, English is their second language, and they do not speak English much at home. I believe that's Christina. That is that's Christina, for example. Um, we do have students that are eligible for ESL services, and there is a specific, um, the, uh, an ESL student can absolutely get into Hume Fogg, and there are like uh, rules for that, which are on the MNPS website. Um, as far as getting in, so uh, once you, when you have that B average, and you have uh, proficient or advanced on your uh, TCAP, uh, then, and you apply, which is online and pretty simple to do, it is a lottery, so, but that is pretty absolute. Now, 
there is, we do have a couple feeder schools. One of them is also an academic magnet called MEGS, but one of them is John Early. And um, those students, like if they do, um, because it's based on your seventh grade TCAP, um, if they do, like, let's say they were not quite proficient, but if they are proficient on their eighth grade one, uh, then they do get admitted to Hume Fogg. So great question. Thank you so much for that, Representative. Yes, Representative Hakeem. Thank you very much again, Madam Chair. Um, the, the students you have with you, I guess I'll use the term, I pick up no fear from mm -hmm. them as to who they are and what mm -hmm. they're about. And I think that comes from what they're being taught in school, to be themselves the best they can be. So I'm impressed with that. Mm -hmm. uh, my Thank second that. question, um, in your library, I, I don't want to start problems for you, but I, I think I have to ask this. Are there limits on your library as to the offerings you have to your students? Um, well, what I would say is that it's very important when you have so many AP classes that you offer the books that are going to support those curriculums. Those are based on the standards of the state of Tennessee, but it's also based on the college board standards. So when we think about supporting the curriculum, we also think about the fact that 90% of my students take a a college level English class, and that I you know, need to make sure that I have the books to support that. Um, so um, we uh, obviously follow the law, but uh, again, we serve all our students. Um, and there, and um, so we wa always wanna make sure that we are, um, have the books available to help them uh, grow as far as academically, but also um, that they that we have the books that uh, that that will also help them grow and as a person, you know, um, being in this wonderful pluralistic uh, country, meaning that we come with all our different, uh, we we bring everything we have with us to to here. Um, it's a lot of times we can learn so much about reading or interacting with people who bring different experiences. Um, but we can also see, just like Christina said, like when you're able to see yourself in other people or in books, how important that is. Um, so, okay, um, thank you. All right, Madam Chair, thank you very much. And to the Hume Falk family, mm -hmm. you're outstanding. Oh, okay. thank you so much. Okay. That means so much to us. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dixie. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Smithfield. Would yes. you tell me what your title is? Yes, I'm the librarian at Hume Fogg Academic Magnet School. Well, thank you for your service. And it's amazing that as the librarian, you have such knowledge and interaction with your children, mm -hmm. students. Sorry, I, I know you probably consider them your children mm -hmm. too as well. <clears throat> And I appreciate what you do, what you do for them. And I just want to tell you about my experience that mm -hmm. I've had with your class and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and with your students in the past is they brought me a bill last year. Mm -hmm. And um, they came up with the bill, mm -hmm. developed it, wrote the bill, did everything. They worked the bill, mm -hmm. even started a website for the bill. Mm -hmm. And all it did was simply um, be able to let students know at the point of the age of 18 Mm -hmm. how to vote, where to vote, and where to register to vote. Yeah, unfortunately, didn't pass because of politics, but they got a first-hand view of how politics work, and a lot of them were disappointed. But I was amazed at the work, because it they put in over a year's work. It started off with an assignment, class assignment, if I'm not mistaken, and um, it grew over into a year's work of work. And I, a lot of those kids have gone on to college now, but that was such a great experience just for me to see the dedication for those students that were willing to see something through that they had no idea about that even existed before that you brought to them. So, and the one thing that I want to say to you that I appreciate is that how the involvement you are within the students. People think just because you're a librarian, you just check out books and that's it. A librarian has, wears many hats and you've done an excellent job. All of you wear many hats, and I'm not just singling her out, but I know that it takes a village to do these kids and to have these wraparound services that you provide for them. So I want to thank you for what you're doing, and just to let you know that I truly do appreciate you and, and what you've done, and I continue to work 
hopefully continue to work with you and you'll bring some more bills and mm -hmm. some other students will want to do the same thing because it was a pleasure to see them get to talk with not only the House representatives but the Senate mm -hmm. as well to understand truly how government works and not just sit, read it out of a book. So thank you for giving them that experience as, mm -hmm. as um, you spoke about earlier. Thank you, Representative Dixie. That actually was something the students did on their own. That was no class assignment. They did that all on their own. Uh, but one of the things we really emphasize in this, again, this wonderful country, I just go back to it all the time because I, I love serving kids and I love uh, what I do, is teaching how government works. And you guys really helped me do that and being so close to you. Um, and uh, I just have some pictures to show over, over time, like how many people who work in this building come and benefit my, my students, my kids. Um, so you've come for our lunch and learns and we would like for you guys to come for our lunch and learn and talk to our, our students sometime. You've allowed us to meet with you in your office. Um, we uh, also, the people who come here to lobby you have also spoken to us. The Beacon Center came and they talked to us about special interest groups. We learned about criminal justice reform. They're actually coming back in a couple of weeks to talk about barriers to entrepreneurship. Uh, we've been able to go into, uh, to walk up here and watch the Senate in full session and see them pass bills. Um, we've been able to actually speak to you like we are now. Former Senator uh, Dickerson invited us to, invited one of my students to speak uh, to a committee. Um, we had a chief of staff, Joseph Williams, came over to talk to my kids about what it's like to run for office. Um, uh, last year, we ran into a uh, legislative liaison for the governor, uh, Eric Mayo. I like to say the only reason my kids are smiling is because I didn't, hadn't told them that he's actually an Alabama fan, and they probably wouldn't have been smiling if they knew that, because, you know, lots of my kids go to UTK, but we'll just forgive them for that, so... And uh, we have a special invitation to you. Please join us in visiting the castle. Uh, we'd also like to um, welcome the opportunity to see what a typical day for you looks like, and we'd love to shadow you for the day if that opportunity was to arise. I just can't uh, say enough. Like, thank you so much. Do you know how powerful it feels to sit here? And for you to give my students the ability to sit here um, and speak to you, that means so much to me. It means so much to our faculty, um, and it just means uh, so much to, to our city, um, to our school system, and everything you do touches my kids. When you vote on uh, things like uh, how long the cycle is for textbooks, that affects my kids. When you vote on math standards, when you talk about math standards, that affects my kids. Uh, when you vote on, you know, um, all sorts of legislation, it affects my kids. And I want you to know that we, uh, being so close to you, we're always available. If you want to have student voice, if you want to find out what teachers is or take a, take a field trip down to Hume Fog to get some insight, we would always love to host you. And we are so grateful to you for hosting us this morning. It's been an honor to speak to you this morning, and we're very grateful for that. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Can y'all stick around? We have a couple of more people that would like questions. Beautiful, yes. Uh, next on the list, I have Chairman Sapicki. Is it for the students or? Okay, uh, hang on to that. Chairman Reagan, is your, do you have questions for the students? students. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have some for the administrators too. Okay. Uh, ladies, thank you for being here. Uh, and to you, Ms. Wilson, you have chosen a uh, difficult mm. path to trod. I went to the Air Force Academy mm. many decades ago, <laughs> but it is, it is something that is worth doing. It's 24 years of service to my country. I don't regret a minute. I think you'll be the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is basically, how can we, from your perspective, translate the successes from Hume Fogg to the rest of our school districts? By the way, that will be the administrator's questions, too. <laughs> um, I think one of the things at Hume Fogg that has um, surprised me and really 
um, opened my eyes to what I can do outside of high school is the opportunities that we're given. We are given from an earlier time than I feel like most high school students opportunities to take incredibly challenging courses. And I have, I am currently taking four AP classes. Um, I didn't realize how much that was gonna be when I first <laughs> signed up for it. And it has been an incredibly challenging year, but I have learned so much about what it means to, um, I, I, I have failed tests that I never thought I would fail. And I've had the opportunity to take that and learn from it. And I think that we are provided the opportunity to mess up, but learn from those mistakes and really grow from those mistakes. And the challenging environment, um, it, it just helps us all want to strive for excellence. I feel like we're given a high standard and that high standard is something that we can work to achieve. And if, if we see that we can achieve more in school than I think um, out of school, we want to push ourselves to go further as well. What do you think? Representative Reagan, I think that we should like consider like the inequities of like the city as a whole because we see Hume Fogg and we see all these advantages, but like we overlook like zone schools, like my zone school, for example, is Pearl Cone. And so like, unfortunately, those kids don't have the same resources that I do. So I think like just researching what inequities that we have as like a school district would be so much helpful because that way we can be like, oh, they need more laptops or they need, you know, better, you know, ESL instructors or, you know, more, you know, resources that would help them to succeed. Because it's not, it's not just up to the teachers. And I feel like that's been the problem lately, that it's all up to the teachers. But I think if, if we all do this together, then we can get out of this like hole where like some, some students are getting more resources than others. Uh, great question. Um, so supporting kids in learning how to read, which I believe is one of the emphasis that you guys have had, um, talking about background knowledge and phonics in early elementary school. Um, reading is the foundation for everything. Um, and um, But that also goes into like as, as a teacher, um, you know, there's a lot on us. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, like I would, I would love to just be able to teach and like uh, work with these kids and help them learn how to cite properly and how to evaluate websites. Um, but there's always, there's always so much more that we're responsible for. And every year it seems like those responsibilities grow. Um, and so, um, you know, funding wise, like having people to take over some of those responsibilities where they aren't, aren't on me. So one thing we've seen is, and there was a report last week about um, how uh, mental health challenges and what like the percentage of girls and, and adolescent young men and young ladies um, and how, how, what percentage of them feel persistently sad. And what we know is that like when you come to school and you're hungry or you're, um, upset about something or you're persistently sad, it's really hard to learn, right? Um, I, had a, I had a colonoscopy last week and I couldn't eat that day and I was extremely cranky. Um, and so I was thinking about like, gosh, you know, like uh, I can't imagine having to take a test, you know, like that. So, um, so providing those resources, um, you know, things like increasing BP money, but also like uh, providing uh, more money where, where the people who need to be in the school can take some of that burden off uh, teachers. So like being able to hire more counselors, for example, where they can um, deal more with that because I wanna teach and we need to teach kids. We need to help them get the background information that they need to um, be able to participate um, in our society. Um, and so that funding helps um, to take some of that, can take some of that burden off of teachers where we can focus on funding. So not only like funding in school, but also 
uh, taking care and looking at some of these issues where when they come to school, you know, they're fed um, and they aren't in distress because of their housing situation. And those are all things that, that we can all, that, that, that you guys can affect. And I thank you so much for that question. That's a wonderful question. And thank you for your years of service. So that means a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sapiki. Just to touch ladies on uh, the students. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said, uh, I would like to know what middle school you came from. Mm. Hopefully it wasn't Meg's or one of your magnet schools. And if it was Meg's, we understand that there's a difference there. But if, if it wasn't Meg's, we'd like to know mm. with the inadequacies you spoke of at Pearl Cone extending down to middle schools, how do you overcome that mm. to, to get into Hume Fogg? So I would like to start off with, I went to John Early the first two years, and then I went to Head Middle, and that's where I saw the change. So um, as I mentioned before, like there are some schools like such that, that I have mentioned that like don't have, unfortunately, the provided resources. I just think that like you have to push yourself despite the obstacles. Like unfortunately, as I said before, like they don't have these resources, but a resource is not going to determine who I'm going to be in life. And also, there are teachers there, despite those obstacles, that are there to push you. And I had teachers who, like, supported me throughout all the way and, like, who believed. And they were like, I see you there. So that just meant a lot to me. Hmm. I did go to meds. <laughs> um, but I would agree with Christina on the teacher's that was very important to me throughout middle school because while it was definitely a privilege to have the opportunity to go to Meg's, which if you, as long as you make the general scores, you are automatically guaranteed a spot at Hume Fogg, um, it was still a diff difficult curriculum. Uh, and that, that at a young age, that was something that was very new coming from elementary school where like there's not much homework and you really, you're not having to work for very much to a school where you are pushed academically and outside of the classroom to uh, excel in extracurriculars and, and other things of that nature. Um, so I think the teachers being willing to help you through those things and really support you in all of your endeavors, um, I think that's incredibly important as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Members, is there anyone else that has question for our two students? We'll bring the other administrators back up for more questions is what I'm trying to get at. So thank you. You did a remarkable job. <laughs> we look forward to reading and hearing about all the things you will be doing when upon graduation. And uh, thank you for taking all those questions. You did great. All right, members now. Uh, on my list for the admin, uh, Chairman White. Thank you, Chair Lady. Uh, Dr. Hodges, I have one for you, because you said something earlier that I think is worth repeating if I understood it correctly. The students at Hume Fogg are high performing, so your teachers must also be high performing. But you said that the teachers and the students were able to keep that level five, even mm -hmm. though they're high performing students. Mm -hmm. And that's a debate, debate we have over here all the time, is can a high performing student still show enough growth so that teacher can remain to be a level five? And I think I understood you said at Hume Fogg, that's true. Did at Hume Fogg, it is true, mm -hmm. yes. Um, specifically, well, all of our EOC scores uh, and teachers and students demonstrated a level five. Our, uh, Integrated Math 1 scores were at a 3, so we met those. Um, and we can go on and on somewhere else about the why there and how we're working to, to push those up. Um, so our Integrated Math 1 were at a level 3, and I think our U.S. History scores were at a uh, 4. Uh, so we weren't quite at the 5. All of the others had met level 5s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, overall our average is 5. Yes, Chairman White. Yeah, one follow-up is, uh, I'll say, where do you, where do the most of the teachers at Hume Fogg come from? Are they long-term with Hume Fogg, or? Uh, we do generally keep the, the teachers that we have who um, are hired. I mean, you know, we have people 
migrating in, migrating out, especially with what's going on in Nashville and the in Tennessee with growth and jobs, et cetera, going in and out. Um, but we generally have a pretty solid teaching staff, and they stay uh, put. We have had in the last um, five, six, seven years um, some migration out of younger teachers um, and then retirement for sure. And I won't lie to you, COVID, the pressures, um, and just the change of things. We, we have seen it more and more challenging the last two to three years of finding um, teachers yeah. for positions that we have, especially in our like physics and some of our higher level maths and sciences, of course. Yeah. Those are hard to find. Well, thank you. That's encouraging. Thank you. Um, just to add on to that is that, um, so this is my 12th year at Hume Fogg, and we've never had sub shortages before, but one of the things that, uh, fortunately, we have a couple of general assistants, but like, because people always wanted to come to our school to sub, but uh, it is, there's days where we don't have subs for classes at Hume Fogg, and when you talk about impacting your ability to you know, get through the day when those classes are split or they're being watched by, like you can't give a test because there are four IS, four classes together in the cafeteria because you didn't have subs. I mean, that definitely affects all, all of us teachers and our administrators too. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sapiki. Thank you. So um, you, you made a comment about uh, the minimum requirement for Hume Fogg is a 14 ACT. Oh, on oh. that part of it, right? Oh, uh, 14 on the, um, the, so 14 as far as like, if you are not taking, um, if you're not taking the TCAP, which has that, uh, you know, proficient advance. So if you're, say if you're coming from a private school, you would have to have a stay nine of 14. So our average ACT score is 26.5 for the last year. So um, yes, so the 14 is just like, if you're coming, let's say you're taking the California aptitude test, because uh, you go to uh, Christ Presbyterian Academy or whatever test they take, and so you would need, it, it's at seven in each of the seven, say nine out of nine, um, for a total of 14. So you could actually technically have a nine in math and like a five in English. Okay, so let me follow up with that. Um, do you track your students? How often do your students take the ACT? Mm. We're preparing for the ACT in March, um, upcoming in a couple of weeks, I guess. Um, our school sponsors ACT prep, which we just uh, held actually on Monday. Our students, we had about 70 children who came on a day off to do an, a full day ACT prep. Uh, but we um, do, all of our juniors will take the ACT and we do ACT prep um, embedded in some of our classes, or we have that uh, currently, I know, in our, in our library. Uh, our seniors who want to retake it, of course, will retake it. Um, and then we do have a group of teachers and other staff members um, classified who will come on a Saturday and will allow Hume Fogg, we allow Hume Fogg to be a, a national test site so that we can have anyone who needs to take it. We feel like our students do better, perhaps, if they're in their space uh, and see the faces of their teachers and support staff there. Um, but but that is it. Like our, If our freshmen take the ACT, then they're taking that on their own in a national test date. We don't host or sponsor an ACT test for our freshmen or our sophomores. We'll, we'll do more prep work than that. Mm -hmm. They, they take a practice test when the juniors take one and when the seniors that take is. one. And can I, can I just say, like, what a blessing that uh, you guys ha having the ability to test all our kids for the ACT once in the spring at their junior year and once in the fall. Um, that has just been a wonderful thing. So thank you so much a few years ago for making that come to light because that has just really... It's really made a difference. So thank you for that. Madam Chair. Yes, Chairman Sipiki. Um, on standards at your high school, do you teach the standards that are supplied by the State Board of Education? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, and approximately how many students do you have at Hume Fogg? Approximately 900. And how many do you turn away? Um, generally, we'll have anywhere from 75 to 90 on a freshman waiting list. We may turn away about 40 or so uh, sophomores and then juniors 
18 to 20 seniors, 10 to 12 perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, less and less as students get more and more connected to their current schools, they don't want to come over. Yes, Chairman. In your professional opinion, as, as the principal, principal, right? Yes, sir. In your professional opinion as the principal at Hume Fogg, is there an opportunity for replication of this school where more children could take advantage of these opportunities that, that you, you are presenting? And then second of all, can the experience of Hume Fogg, the, the regimented curriculum, the uh, uh, striving for excellence, do you believe that that could be replicated? It's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, and I think about that often, especially when I go and sit with my peers at district principal meetings and their schools look and feel different than mine. Um, I do think that there's, um, that we have a special sauce there and I don't think that you can remove the uh, involvement of parents in that choice process from that a uh, set of variables that makes my school special and, and the, the, one of the things that helps propel um, the involvement and engagement of our students in that program is clearly the fact that their uh, parents or family members are pushing them towards a place that they believe in. Um, I do think it can be replicated. I do think that it cannot be replicated without lots of variables working uh, in tandem, and I think that's the special sauce that, and that's the difficulty of your jobs, mm -hmm. really, and the difficulty of mine. Thankfully, I've been given lots of those um, ingredients mm -hmm. in outstanding staff members, the support of the district. Um, believe it or not, Hume Fogg is the lowest funded high school in our district. It is not the highest funded, um, and that is because we do have more money that goes to children with higher need. And often those higher needs equate to um, lower test scores or um, economic disadvantaged. And, um, and we don't have as much of that as our other sister schools do. Um, but we do have, um, rather than constraining our students, what I've seen in my experience as both kind of a traditional school principal and then a magnet school principal, um, what, what I do see in this experience um, is that we have a group of people who are dedicated to learning and who love learning. Um, and so they come to us that way, both student, staff, and, and family. Um, and we also have a, a history or a legacy of excellence. And it's really nice when you can anchor into something in your history. And of course, you saw what we have there. So we, can, we have something we can anchor into to kind of help propel. Um, but we also, I don't constrain our students or our staff because of fear of compliance or whatever. What we do rather is we find the giftings of all of our teachers and our students and we acknowledge that. And we say that when we come together um, and, and acknowledge the value of both our student voice and our teacher voice in this, and we let those things rise rather than kind of being a top down type of leader, I would prefer to hear their voices. If I can allow them the freedom to share from their hearts, the freedom to learn um, relevant materials, and if I can just help put those pieces in, pl in place to inspire them, then they propel themselves. And mm. really, I can just come in and sit on this row back here and not have to speak so much. Mm. Um, I think that that is in the heart of every educator that I've ever met, in the heart of every administrator, and it's in the heart of every student and parent to want to be their absolute best, but it's just finding what are those variables and how can we bring those together. So it's not constraining out of fear or top-down kind of thing for us. Um, we are quite lenient. You know, if you come in, it, you're going to see a lot of children looking a lot of different ways um, and, and expressing themselves and studying various um, classes, and, and, and but it's because of that, I think that they are able then to become their best selves rather than trying to put everybody in, pigeonhole them into a, a, a certain way of doing things. Um, that is a snippet. The answer is yes, I do think it can be replicated, but I do think it's very difficult and you've got to have everybody believe in that and, uh, and collaborating. And we do have that. We're not com competitive, although I would say we, we do compete very well, but our students are less competitive, they're more competitive with themselves um, and more collaborative with one another and our teachers are collaborators with them and that mm -hmm. is some magic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as I promised, one of you already got a shot at the question here. And to piggyback on my colleagues' questions here, uh, we have a million thereabouts students in our K through 12 system, over 1,800 schools, and 147 school districts. Uh, the average ACT is not what our state brags on, because statistically you should eliminate anything outside the third standard deviation to characterize your system. Your school is well outside that third standard deviation. So for, in process improvement, the goal is to find those things that happen outside that third standard deviation and incorporate it within it, specifically to that center line if you can. So when I ask, and when he asks what can be transported, the core to that question is uh, you all are doing the things right. However, specifically, uh, the, the term funding was mentioned. We've gone to a new funding formula, mm -hmm. TISA, which is student-centered. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's going to, I hope, address some of those issues. But uh, completely apart from the funding, uh, put your finger on the thing that you think is the most universal thing to transport to another school district, whether it's in Mountain City or Memphis or uh, Stewart County or Hamilton County, I don't care. What can we take from your success that is universally applicable? My mind, um, sorry, thank you, Representative Reagan. My mind immediately goes to um, teacher quality. And um, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the fact that, um, and when I say teacher, of course, I'm including librarians and all of our certificated staff um, and classified staff. But I have a group of people who are dedicated, who love to learn and who are dedicated to their craft. Um, and we hold ourselves accountable as the adults for the level of rigor that students need to demonstrate the outcomes that you are wanting um, on the ACT. It is not just that we do some ACT prep work or that 70 students showed up and sat and got some information or got a little extra help um, on Monday, but it really is the rigor that's happening day in and day out in our classroom, period. Um, we, we push them. Every year, our graduates come back from their colleges, and that, in my mind also, if I might add, says a lot about what our school is and the relationships that we develop with our children. Um, I don't always go, I don't go back a lot to my high school. Loved it, it was a great experience, fine. Um, but our children repeatedly come back. Uh, in fact, we have to tell them, like, oh my gosh, please leave. You know, you, you're grown now. Um, but uh, they come back and they say, we were more than prepared for college. And they tell our students currently, you are being more than prepared for college. Uh, not just with time management and organization, but we have taught them from their freshman t um, year, you're going to think in this classroom. Um, we're not going to hand feed you. And, and that takes just like time. So time for planning for my mm -hmm. teachers, um, meaningful standards, which the state has provided really mm -hmm. good, high mm -hmm. quality, rigorous standards, deeper rather than wide. All of those mm -hmm. things are important and it's not fun to talk about. It doesn't, there's no sparkle to that. Um, but the, the real magic is happening in every classroom and it really is teachers. Um, and it's giving teachers time to be good, high quality teachers, listening to them and giving them time to do what it is they need to do, training them, giving them planning time uh, and, and pushing them to dig deeper and make the students do the heavy lifting. That's what we've been talking about for about three or four years at HIMFOG. Uh, and now when we go in and do our uh, classroom walkthroughs, what, what, we, what we are looking for is no longer what is the teacher doing, although that is of, of importance, of course, but we are looking for what are the students doing mm -hmm. in the class? What are the questions the students are asking? And if the teacher is always asking the questions and then always answering those questions, or if those questions are always yes, no questions, uh, then there's very little thinking that is required. Rather, they're going to have to not only just answer the question, but then dig into the why. And now can you also go beyond that into the text that we're looking at or bring in a separate text and share a supporting um, uh, excerpt as to why you think that this then correlates to that? 
and again, th there's no sparkle to what I just said. <laughs> it's uh, pretty mundane sounding for those of us who, or those who don't teach, but for the teacher, that stuff is exciting to them. And if you can allow that and give that to your teachers and get them mm -hmm. excited about teaching, they're going to help you get there. Right. Uh, Representative Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say a quick thank you because what I see, everybody talks about pushing the students, but what I see is the support. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, that makes all the difference when these students feel included and even in a, in a broad environment that, that, you know, they all sorts of diversity, they feel a part of that school and they feel supported. Mm -hmm. And that support is everything to mm -hmm. a student. Mm -hmm. So challenging a student is uh, works much better when they feel completely supported. And I definitely see that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a joy to see. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. It's a joy to work with them. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sabiki. So you touched on something that, that piqued an interest here. Time. Mm. Okay. So you're teaching the same standards of every high school in Tennessee. Is that correct? Mm. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Are you on a block or period schedule? We're on a period schedule. Period schedule. How many Actually, we we ha we are hybrid. on a hybrid, mm -hmm. and so we do periods on Monday, Thursday, Friday, and we do double alternating block on Tuesday and Wednesday. That allows us block time to do deeper, like labs, uh, and additional activities. Okay. So, one of the major complaints we get from teachers across the state is that we don't have enough time for what you spoke about, depth, knowledge, and understanding. Mm. It's, you can teach a, a child a principle, mm -hmm. but if you teach them the depth, knowledge, and understanding of how to research, develop, and defend that, that, that state, where are you creating the time? Mm. How is Hume Fogg different in the time realm than other, other high schools? Um, it's a great question. Thank you, Representative. I ask Sabiki. good ones all the time. Um, mm. <laughs> We, we need, our teachers would likely say that they could take more time um, because it really is the time. The teachers still pack their teacher bags full mm -hmm. of essays and take them home to grade. I mean, like, so um, the time for the grading and feedback isn't really there like I would like for it to be. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you create that without doing a 24-hour school. But I will tell you that I am very intentional about allowing them those in-service days and planning days uh, as as little time as I can take from them, I will. And I have learned to lessen that, lessen my mm -hmm. time that I take from them over the course of the past 11 years that I've been principal there. Uh, I take less and less each year. Uh, so on Monday, we had a half a day of conferencing day and a half a day of planning. Um, and so I don't, I didn't, give them anything. There was no faculty meeting. I'm giving it to them in an mm. email. Um, our faculty meetings are once a month for an hour. If I can get them out in 30 minutes, I will, because after they've taught all day, many of them get there at 630 in the morning. They're there until five, you know. So I'm, I'm just taking as little time from them as I can, because I have realized that the more I talk, the less they can actually do of meaning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, I need to get out of their way. Um, and I have tried to come up with rotations for, for instance, things that uh, that are meaningful. Like the, the work of our school is more than just classroom teaching. We manage lots of documents and uh, school improvement plans and, and um, you know, lots of data entry and IEPs and 504 plans and meeting for those. Uh, and so the business of schooling is occurring. But how do we do that more and more efficiently? Um, well, who are the people that we can take to use for those meetings? Mm -hmm. I rotate teachers in. We don't mandate that all teachers are there. We've got a system together where they can give feedback, but they don't have to attend. One will attend. And ju just trying to be mindful that the most important thing that I can give is teacher time to get to their craft, to learn what it is that they need to teach, to go deeper and richer so that those children so that their experiences are deeper and richer. Um, it's not the best answer, but that's what I have done, is less of me as much as possible. Follow up. Yes, Chairman. So the entrance criteria for Hume Fogg is proficient or advanced. Mm -hmm. Could that be the key to the time, is that your, your teachers are not having to remediate kids who are two and three grade levels behind, where everybody is showing up to your doorstep who is proficient and advanced and on accelerated learning paths 
So now the teachers can push to depth knowledge of understanding instead of having to remediate kids in their class that are two and three grade levels behind. That absolutely is a very absolutely is a variable um, because it's not. Well, it, it would be a variable even for growth, but clearly they come achieving mm -hmm. at a met or above for the uh, expectations or standards. Um, I would actually like to add a snippet that I, I don't believe we brought up when um, someone was talking about our EL students and the population. I think mm -hmm. it was Representative Hakeem. Um, for those students and those entry requirements, mm -hmm. if a student is a designated um, English language learner, he, they will need to only meet or exceed in one of those, math or reading, but not both. Uh, and we do that uh, so that we can make sure that we are um, allowing uh, meaningful and mindful access to those students so that they can to uh, get into that. So I wanted to add that. Um, but I, I think, yes, they come in high achieving. Our students, I mean, our teachers push them, however, uh, and the value added scores, are th those are the types of things that you can see for that. Um, so I, I hope that that, that answers it. your question. And yeah. then follow up on that is, you talked about your teachers, and I, I believe that you have some very, very, very good teachers. Do you guys partner with Lipscomb, Belmont, Vanderbilt to create a student teaching mm. initiative at, your, at Hume Fogg so that every one of your teachers is assigned somebody who wants to get into the teaching profession so they can learn from the best mm -hmm. to be able to share that when they go to, because there's only so many positions at Hume Fogg, right. that they can go to other high schools and other schools around the state and bring the, what Hume Fogg is to other parts mm -hmm. of the state. Thank you for asking that question. Um, we do not mandate or require that our teachers take on um, uh, the mentoring role for a student teacher. At any In any given semester, we have anywhere from three to six, seven or eight at times have been um, student teachers placed. And we would partner with any of our higher ed institutions that are, that are in the area, uh, absolutely, and do. Uh, so that our teachers could be mentors. Again, I would I would never mandate that because I would not want to do that to a teacher. Teachers, in addition to their careers, of course, have family issues, and so you know sometimes it's a season for them to mentor. Other times, it's just not an appropriate season for them to mm -hmm. to do the job that they would need to do for that. But we love that and always have student teachers. I love that we give back. Uh, to the field of education in that way. Uh, but I also know that it sharpens the salt of our current teachers because they're involved in mentoring and teaching younger people. And I know that we had, for instance, uh, Ms. Torres who came in and, uh, and is now working over at NSA in, in mathematics. And much of what she's doing in the classroom there looks very similar to what we were doing in the classrooms at Hume Fogg. And it's really fun to see how that uh, is happening across the district. Madam Chairman, the last, the last question I would ask is to you to ask our guests here, because sometimes we forget to ask the question that you really mm -hmm. wanted to answer. Mm -hmm. Or you thought about something that you could possibly make it a recommendation to us on something that could be replicated, mm -hmm. right? That we could turn into legislation. So my request is, Madam Chairman, if you'll think about that, mm -hmm. and if anything crosses your mind or your teacher's minds, if you'll get that to Chairman, our Ch Ch Chair Lady Moody, and she can disseminate that to both sides of education here, we got two committees mm -hmm. here, and maybe we can expand on that and maybe help other kids in the state of Tennessee. One thing I would recommend, I don't know if you guys have this or not, but we've been so lucky to have so many people because we're so close to you, um, interact with my kid, interact with my students. And I know you guys interact um, with the students that are in your, uh, that you represent. Um, if you don't have a youth advisory council, that might be something you consider forming. Um, that would be a chance for you to hear from them virtually. You know, we have all these tools now uh, once a month, but like that just, empowers kids like you have now, but that also gives you direct insight. So whether it's like a teacher and student um, advisory council where they where they are, um, you know, I think that is something that I would recommend you do. And I think that students would love to be a part of that. And um, and that I also think that you would really love it too. And I know so many of you, so many of you guys have such great relationships with the schools in your district. Um, but like getting to know students personally, because uh, like I, I think y'all know this, teenagers can get, they they keep it real for you. You know, like if I ask uh, Clara or Christina, they'll politely tell me, um, but they'll. 
they'll tell me what I can do better by all means if I ask them uh, to, if I'm seeking authentic feedback. Um, so, um, and the other thing I'd say is like, just like Dr. Hargis say, think about when you're passing, with legislation, there's often unintended consequences. And so thinking about like, is this legislation gonna ask teachers to do more, which takes them away from planning or takes them away from uh, meeting with students to help them. So like always thinking about that. And sometimes of course that has to be done, right? But uh, just being thoughtful about like what you're specifically asking educators to add to their plate. So thinking about how can you take things off the plate of educators um, and uh, where they can focus on what they do best, which is teaching students, giving them the background knowledge that they need um, to, uh, to be successful and to, to understand and, and to participate in our democracy, right? Democracy is, is demanding. Um, uh, and, and so we, we really think about um, giving our students at Hume Fogg um, and modeling for them the civic behaviors that they're gonna need to be uh, you know, engaged um, as American citizens. We actually, our motto is that we, um, that, that we're, we, we always say we're equipping uh, and that we're, we're equipping and empowering and engaging our students. Um, and I think that's what a good school does. And the more that you can help us do that to make these students into participating and uh, participating members of our American uh, democracy. Um, and you do that in so many ways, um, by your example for one, but like being thoughtful about that legislation, um, that is like the best thing you can do. And I appreciate you guys so much, but I'm just gonna say, at the end of the day, I still think I have the best job in the entire world, um, but I appreciate you guys so much for the job that you do, legislators, and thank you for being so, thinking about our students, um, and thank you for having them here and for us here to, to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we had one more that had a comment or question, but we're short on time. I know. Need to be out. Are you good with that, Representative Dixie? You probably know. Um, members. Motion to go back in session. Yes, we need to go back. <laughs> We're right, back thank in you. session. Well, we can't thank you enough for coming and spending your morning with us and bringing the students and an alum that's now teaching there. Um, we we just thank you all. And, and we do look forward to hopefully visiting you. And... Uh, we love having shadows mm. with us, so we'll 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 all probably be in touch, reaching Beautiful. out to you. But thank you again thank for you. everything you're doing, and all your thoughts and help. We do appreciate it so much. So thank we'll you. be in touch. And yeah, Chairman if you have that question that Chairman Sapicki mentioned, feel free to send it our way because we'd like to communicate with you on that. All right, members, I see no more. Motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.